leading everyday people to love Jesus and make Him known. Here's our pastor, Dr. Larry LeBlanc. Genesis chapter 16. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. And Abram agreed to what Sarai said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan ten years, Sarai's wife took her Egyptian slave Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar, and she conceived. And when she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. And then Sarai said to Abram, You're responsible for the wrong I'm suffering. I put my slave in your arms, and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your slave is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think best. And then Sarai mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. Lord, teach us today that divine destiny is never met with human solutions. Lord, help us to see today that it's not about you helping those who help themselves. And that, Lord, if we want something done right, we may be the last people we need to count on to get it done. So, Lord, increase our faith today and help us to look towards you to do what only you can do. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Please be seated. And our prayer this morning matches our big idea. You'll see on the screen that divine destiny is never met with human solutions. Divine destiny is never met with human solutions. We've known from the outset that God had a plan. That when God called Abram out of the earth of the Chaldees in Genesis chapter 12, and we have been on this journey the entire time, it is as if the, the one lingering thought in all of our minds is, when will they have this miracle baby? And yet it hasn't happened yet. So we keep reading and we keep waiting and we keep wondering how God is going to bring this about. Well, I don't know about you, but there have been times in my life where I've been tired of waiting. There have been times in my life where I've been tired of praying. There have been times in my life where I've thought, it's time for something to happen. It's time to make something happen. In fact, I, I can't just sit here idly by because, I mean, I've heard my whole life that idle hands are what? A devil's workshop. So it must be that God needs some help with this. It must be that, that God can't quite do what it is that He needs to be done. And maybe all the time that has passed, maybe that's my sign that God wants me to step up and help him out and come up with a plan and then all God will have to do is bless my plan any of you ever been there any of you ever lived that lie I think before we throw ashes all over Abram before we crucify him for the actions that we are about to read and study I think we need to remember that every single one of us at some point in our life has done something almost identical to what Abram has done Maybe not in taking a second wife and having a child, but certainly in deciding that we've got, our, we've got it figured out and that God needs help. You see, what's interesting in this passage is some of the things that we don't read. We don't read in this passage that Abram ever sought the Lord about this plan. How many of you have ever pushed forward with something and then looked back and said, I wish I'd have spent a little more time praying about that? We don't read once. That Sarah ever prayed about this. They hadn't sought the Lord's guidance, but to be honest, the Lord had already given guidance. He had already told Abram. Now, now, some people will say, well, he never specifically said that Sarah was going to be the one that was going to have the children. But what we know, obviously, in this passage is that God was already planning on working a miracle through this family. And so that as we are reading about it, we recognize that the waiting and the patience is part of this journey of faith that he has Abram on. And so it's fascinating to me sometimes what's not mentioned, certainly the lack of prayer. 
But I think that brings up an important application that's worth spending just a few minutes talking about this morning. And that is how many times we hear people praying about things that they don't need to pray about. Did you know sometimes people pray about things they don't need to pray about? Some of you are thinking right now, we're supposed to pray about everything. There's some things you do not need to pray about. You can take that as a note. Now, if you write a question mark, what could it be? If you are praying about things that God has already specifically commanded, there's no reason to pray about it because God's already answered the prayer through His Word. I hear people praying all the time about completely unbiblical things. Well, I'm just going to ask the Lord and see what He says. Pick up a Bible. He's already said it. If you're trying to decide between whether or not to enter into sin or not enter into sin, you don't have to pray about it. God would have to change His character to answer your prayer. God's not about doing that. If Abram had gone to the Lord, he would have seen obviously what the, te- what the problem was and what God would have convicted him about. But instead, he goes right on with this plan. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. But when is it most difficult to resist temptation? When do you find it most difficult? I can tell you there's some things that will absolutely place you in a difficult spot. When you find yourself frustrated, that's a bad place to be. When you find yourself lonely, when you find yourself angry, if you're tired, if you're hungry, those are all vulnerable spots. But specifically in this passage, let me tell you why it's difficult. Number one is because the temptation is appealing to his natural self. It's appealing to his natural self in two different ways. Number one is it's appealing to his natural self because he's wanting this family. So it is a desire of Abram's already. So it's appealing to a temptation and even it is perverting what God has told him he would do. Not this way, but he says, you know what? That sounds like we could make it work or I could make it work. But secondly, it appealed to the flesh. I don't know that I'm going to that any of you that this is going to be earth shattering. But there are very few men who withstand sexual temptation when it comes, especially like you're reading here. Your wife comes to you and says, hey, I've got a great idea. Remember the girl that we picked up in Egypt? I've kind of noticed you've had your eyes on her for a while. I notice when she walks by that you don't seem to mind. I've noticed that your eyes linger a little too long when she goes by. And custom says that she could actually have my baby. So why don't you go ahead and sleep with her and it will be good for our family. And and I don't know, we're given a general summary of what what went on here. But another thing you don't see is Abram doesn't even say, do you think that's a good idea? He says, okay. And off to the tent they go. Oftentimes in this passage, sometimes the big themes, and we need to pay attention to those, are all we focus on. But I've got to tell you here, I think it's fascinating that there was no arm twisting going on here. And maybe 80% of it was because he wanted to push his line forward and bring this nation apart. But maybe it was because Abram was not thinking correctly. Maybe it was because he found the Egyptian servant attractive. Maybe it was because a moment of lust and a moment of pleasure was better than a lifetime of honoring the Lord. And so we see this starting to play out. And not only is the temptation hard to resist when it comes to the flesh, but please hear me on this. You see people fail. You see people give in to temptation so often when the temptation comes from someone we love or respect. When Paul talks about that we shouldn't be a stumbling block, who, do you, who is the easiest person to be a stumbling block for you? It's not the people you don't trust. It's not the people outside your sphere of influence. It's the people that are right around you that you love, especially the people that you think are supposed to be serving the Lord. And so... Sometimes with those people that we're close to, we put our guard down. And when you put our guard down, someone like Sarah, like his wife, someone like your close friends, someone like people you go to church with, someone that you consider to be a Christian that you've gotten counsel from, and all of a sudden this idea comes from them and 
you accept it more readily than you would from anywhere else. And that's exactly the situation we find ourselves with Abraham and Sarah. And so as we begin to look a little deeper into this passage, it causes us to think back. And I want you to think back on the blunders and mistakes that you've made in your life. I want you to think about the missteps. I want you to think about the direct sin that's taken place in your life. And I'm guessing that many of those times, it is because the flesh allowed emotions to rule in your life. And it's not that we should not have emotions. None of you are robotic. You were created with emotions. You were created to have emotions. Emotions are an important part of who we are. But we've got to be a people who don't allow every emotion to change every whim and every decision that we make. So, because if I'm going to make decisions on my life based on my emotions, then my life is going to look like a roller coaster all the time. Sometimes I need to step back and say, well, I feel like this, but what I feel like and what is right or wrong are two totally different things. I don't doubt Abram was a man. He was an 86-year-old man, but he was a man. And evidently, 86 wasn't quite as old in 86 as 86 is now. And so Abram allows the pressure and he allows the temptation to come on his life. And so because of that, he allows his emotions to rule. He allows the influence to rule over his life. And so he goes and he takes Hagar. And all we're told is that they go together, they sleep together. And the next thing in the narrative is she becomes pregnant. Well, when she becomes pregnant, everything starts to fall apart. I don't know if you noticed that, but it is immediate degeneracy takes place in this family. But before that took place, I, I want you to imagine when they found out that Hagar was pregnant, when Hagar realized that, that she was pregnant, she told Abram and, and Sarah, and I imagine that in those first moments, what do you think the emotion was? I would tell you that I bet it was glee. I think they were happy. I think they were excited. I think they probably responded to that like many of us would. Our plan worked. Oh, Lord, now you don't have to work a miracle. We've already worked a miracle for you. We've gone on ahead of you, and we've gotten the job done. So, God, you can relax, and all you have to do, and we know this because later in the narrative, it's what Abram suggested. Just use Ishmael. Just use Ishmael. May he be the son of blessing. May he be the one. So they begin to believe that their plan, their strategy has worked its way out. But what do we know? Because most of us have read through the end of the story. It had absolutely nothing to do with divine blessing. And so as they begin to justify themselves, now the consequences of sin begin to show themselves and we see it just in the few verses that we just read what's the first thing that happens hagar gets pregnant now she is the servant of sarah right but because she's pregnant we read in the bible that now because she's pregnant and sarah can't get pregnant that hagar begins to taunt her that Hagar begins to use that and to tell Sarah, you see, I'm the one he loves. I'm the only one that can produce a child. And all of a sudden, it got real inside this house. Because now, not only is Hagar taunting Sarah, but Sarah now is furious back at Hagar. She wants her gone. And we even read, who does she blame? Abram, this is your fault. Well, it kind of is. But it was your idea. Does that remind you of any other story in the Bible? You remember this? Genesis chapter 3. What did Adam tell the Lord? I wouldn't have done this. You know I wouldn't have done this. It was that woman. If that woman hadn't been in my life, I'd have never eaten this. You and I were good. But then you took out a rib and made this. Same thing. Now, Sarah, what's she doing? Well, it's your fault. You should have never taken her. You should have never taken this step. And so now we're looking at this aged, wise, blessed father of Israel. And you're expecting a little more probably than what you got out of Abram. Because you're thinking that he's going to assert himself. He's the spiritual leader. He's the one that's had visions of God, right? 
He's the one that has walked with God and spent time with God and heard the audible promises of God. Not Sarah, Abram. He is the one that was called to be the spiritual leader of his house. But what happens now? First of all, he doesn't stop it, doesn't nip it in the bud when the taunting started from Hagar. Now, when Sarah starts mistreating her, he doesn't stop that. Now she comes and blames him. And now what does he do? He says, I don't want to fool with this. She's your servant. And Sarah's saying, she wasn't my servant when y'all were in the tent together. And so Abram abdicates all responsibility. And what does he say? Do with her whatever you want to do with her. And allow Sarah to just kick her out. So as we continue reading through the story, we're seeing a total family breakdown. And I think you ought to know, and please hear me when I say this, there are long-term consequences for short-term pleasure. One of the reasons that families get destroyed is because people don't think about the collateral damage. You think it's all about me and my wants and my needs and my emotions. It's not just about you. You have a wife and you have kids and you have a mother and you have a father and you have brothers and you have sisters and you say, well, that has nothing to do with them. It has everything to do with them. You have a church family and our decisions affect other people and collateral damage is serious. And you're starting to see the collateral damage and you're starting to see the shock waves go out from his family. So much so that I couldn't help but think of this verse. Some of you are going to commit this one to memory. Proverbs chapter 25, verse 24. Young men, you ought to memorize this. Etch it to your hearts. It is better to live on the corner of a roof than in a house with a quarrelsome woman. Well, what if you take this story and put Two women in the mix. Because that's what Abram's got right now. He was living under the promises of God. He was living in the promised land. He was awaiting the miracle of promise. And he took everything to his own hands. And he says, if I want it done right, I guess I need to do it myself. And God only helps those who help themselves. And so instead of waiting on the Lord, he jumps right in. And so what we need to hear today And what we need to apply to every aspect of our life is if we want divine destiny to be realized in our lives, it is going to be because a lot of you, hear me now, hit the brakes, slow down. There is such thing as the discipline of delay. We live in a culture where everything is right now, right now, right now, right now. Microwave, fast food, two-day shipping, bam, bam, bam. And spiritually, we don't want anything to take time to mature. We want it just overnight. We, we want to, to just jump and it, and it be there. But never throughout the course of human history, and especially in God's working with things, are we able to grow in that way. So for a lot of us, when you don't know, when you're confused, instead of just pushing ahead, you need to take just a moment and realize that there is beauty and patience that there is beauty in self-control, that there is beauty in delayed gratification. Vance Havner said, the detour is always worse than the main road. You notice our title this morning, Don't Take the Detour. Don't take the detour. The detour is almost always worse than the main road. And sometimes it is difficult to keep putting one foot in front of the other, doing the next right thing and saying, you know what, I'm going to I'm going to take some chances. I'm going to go this way and I'm going to go that way. And the Lord says to stay on the narrow road. But what happens? So let's just get real. What happens, though, if the situation doesn't change? What you're going to see in the next few weeks is that Abraham and Sarah, they've got 14, 15 more years from this moment until Isaac will be born. That's a decade and a half. 
So what happens in the waiting? What happens if the situation doesn't improve? What happens if the circumstance doesn't get better? Here is the crucible of faith. There is not always a guarantee that your circumstances are going to get better. There's not always a guarantee that your situation is going to change. But here's the guarantee, is that in the midst of it, whether it takes 14 days, 14 years, 14 months, however long it takes, that even if the situation does not change, what we do know is that God's grace is strong enough to change us in our situations. You see, God's greatest goal, and I think this is where, especially in Western Christianity, we've gotten so confused that somehow that God exists for the sole purpose of making you happy. That in all of His infinite wisdom, that His greatest goal in life is to give you what you want. Now, I'll set you up with an easy one. You can even tell by the inflection in my voice. Is that God's greatest goal? So, so what is God's greatest goal? What is God more passionate about than anything else in the universe? What is God's greatest goal? Always and forever, God is consumed with His own glory. The greatest goal that the Lord has is His own glory. So the way that glory is manifested in you and I is not by giving us everything we ever thought we wanted, but it's by creating a holy people. And to be holy, God wants to work in us. And so sometimes the circumstances don't change. Sometimes the situations don't change. But yet in the midst of that, what we do know is that God's grace is still working and working mightily. It's amazing to me as we walk through this story as we've seen Abram abdicate his role as the spiritual leader of his house, we've seen him tank things in his life by bad decisions, we've seen mistreatment among family, but yet in the midst of it, a child is born. A child by the name of Ishmael. And I want you to know today that it is very possible in your life to get an Ishmael instead of an Isaac. Paul helped us to understand that. If you look in Galatians chapter 4, Paul talks about this exact text when he's talking to the church at Galatia. In Galatians chapter 4, you can turn there if you want, or you can. I'll certainly read it to you. Galatians chapter 4, verses 21 through 23. I want you to hear what, what Paul writes about this. Tell me, you who want to be under the law, are you not aware of what the law says? For it is written that Abraham had, two, Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman and the other by the free woman. His son by the slave woman was born according to the flesh. That's Ishmael. But his son by the free woman was born as a result of the divine promise. Now he continues on if you go down to verse 28 and says this, now you brothers and sisters, like Isaac, are children of promise. At that time, the son born according to the flesh persecuted the son born by the Spirit. It is the same now. Now what is Paul specifically talking about? He's talking about that when Abram took over and took Hagar on, he decided to do things by the flesh. That I'm going to do things in a way that I can work it out. He had a child by the flesh. And if you do what works require, you're only going to get what works can produce. And when it comes to him talking to the church at Galatia, he's telling them, you're getting caught up in this works-based faith believing that you can earn your salvation because people have come in among you and said that you've got to have Jesus and works. And what he's saying is, is that if you demand to have it your way, you're going to end up with Ishmael's in your life when I mean for you to have Isaac's. Now, Ishmael ended up being a child of blessing as well. God took care of Hagar and promised that he would make Ishmael into a great nation. And guess what he did? Ishmael is the father of every Arab nation. Now, when you look at the Arab nations, 
all of the Arab nations and the religion that they follow is based on what? Works. Works. Legalistic works. But when you are a child of Abram, when you are a child, not of the natural, but of the spiritual, then what is a true child of Isaac look like? It's not talking about in Galatians being specifically a Jew or a Gentile. It's talking about being a child of God because you were born of not natural descent. You see, every one of you was born, obviously, to your mother. That's your natural birth. But for you to be reborn, John 3, what does he tell Nicodemus? You must be born again. And when I was born again, guess what? That's not a natural birth. That's a spiritual birth. That is a birth that brings us not from works, not from the way we can achieve it, not from the way that we can earn it, not from the way of Ishmael, but from the way of Isaac. And then just a little verse might have caught your eye. In fact, maybe as you were reading in verse 6, you highlighted it. I kept coming back to this phrase over and over and over again because this is what Abram told his wife. Do with her whatever you think best. The greatest problem in this passage and the greatest problem in your life is when you do what you think is best. John 15, verse 5. Jesus is speaking. It'll be in red letters in your Bible. And He says this, Apart from Me, you can do nothing. Nothing. So what does that tell me? If I want something done right, I better let the Lord do it. And it's not that God helps those who help themselves. God only helps those who can't help themselves. God helps those who recognize that they can't do it on their own. Do you know that really God only dwells in two places? God dwells in the high heavenlies, and He dwells in the broken and contrite heart. If He doesn't dwell in your life, it's because you're not broken and you're thinking that you can still captain this ship that you are still the master of your own fate, that you are still the controller of your own life, and the greatest, most freeing thing to happen to someone is to bow before the Lord in brokenness and say, Lord, I can't do it on my own. Proverbs 28, 26. He who trusts himself is a fool. He who trusts himself is a fool. But yet Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him and He will direct your paths. Friends, a fool trusts himself. The truly wise man in a broken and contrite heart comes before the Lord and recognizes that I need you and I need you desperately because a divine destiny is never, ever going to be met with human solutions.